Greetings, this is Quirk Ruby, the Nostalgic Catholic, with another Isaac Asimov short story review. Well, this particular story gets named on the cover, Each an Explorer by Isaac Asimov. However, having read the story and looking closely at that cover for any connection, I find none. This painting used for the cover, whatever it may go to in this magazine, is not connected to Asma's story, Each and Explorer. Um, so let's take a look at what it is. Um, it is also in here, pretty much the same thing. Each and Explorer, and I think Asma, page 42. Yes, on what page is Isaac Asma's story, Each and Explorer, first found? That is the great question of life the universe and everything. Well, probably not. Okay. We do have a blurb, which again only appears in this original publication. So let's take a look at the blurb. Uh, here is a blurb. Be some artwork. We'll go over that artwork in a little bit. Okay. Legend has it that the first dozen stories, Isaac Gasmoff, then in his late teens, submitted to the leading science fiction magazines of the time were returned, but that the 13th was Trends, which saw print in 1939. Whether any or all of those 12 were accepted by other magazines later, we do not know. Well, if you've been following this series, you'll know exactly which stories have and have not uh, found print somewhere at some point in time. Okay. The point is that, one, he didn't hit the bullseye the first time, but had to sweat it out. Two, by the time he made a sale to the market of his desire, he achieved an original, smooth, and distinctive style. Three, due to his early difficulties, he's never become complacent about his writing, but works out each story as if he was still trying to make that first sale to a top science fiction magazine. Well... I don't know the style is totally original. He himself credits Clifford C. Mac with a significant share of having given him a style that he really liked and basically sought to imitate, though he probably has some of his own flavor to it. Continuing, you don't have to take our word for these three points. Exhibit A appears below, and it also shows that despite the fact that Dr. Asimov has become a top-flight novelist since 1939, he hasn't forgotten how to write short stories. So, Each an Explorer by Isaac Asimov, illustrated by Orban. There is a picture here, and it has a little caption on it as well. First, let's look at this picture in some detail. In the distance, you see the rocket, where our men have landed, just two guys. And there are these straw huts where the various animals live. The animals described in the story are pretty much like this. They walk on all fours. They have a bunch of eyes and sort of a circle or a semicircle and kind of move independently, which you can't see from the drawing, but it's what it says in describing the creatures. And there's these various plants that they are very carefully taking care of. The caption reads, Creatures were emerging from the huts, moving closer to the ship with a kind of hesitating trust. Trust. Interesting. Okay. Now, comparing the text between the original and the uh, reissue of the text, text which comes in by Jupiter, um, I only noted a couple actual textual differences that are two of a typographical nature and one of a typeface nature. So, Typographical one, let's see here. Um, there's a place where a comma got accidentally turned into a backwards parenthesis. That's an obvious movie. Towards the end of the story, we keep talking about these plants. And then we went to another plant. Uh, that's supposed to be another plant net. The E got dropped out originally. And that They fixed that one and going to the um, By Jupiter version of the story. And then finally, there's a little parenthetical thought that's in italics, except that it was in the parenthesis. Oh, I have to show the paragraph here so you can see what I'm talking about. 
see where is it? Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, I see that. I'll just read it. Right that makes up for the immovability of the head. No, those independently moving eyes. Okay, thought challenge. Well, the words thought challenge are no longer italics. That's there's your differences. So, enough on all of that. Let's talk about the story itself now. Um, it's kind of an interesting way of handling this. You land on this planet. You got these two guys. One's got this kind of like intuition. That's really good. The other guy doesn't go along with that, any of that kind of nonsense at all. And even the first guy doesn't really think as much to it. But uh, but he does seem to have a fairly good intuition. Um, not perfect, whatever it is. But pretty good. And somehow they seem to feel to be okay. If they land on a spot that's kind of a bare earth area, which immediately seems to exist, each of two planets in his system. Then they get there and they're exploring and looking around. The animals there seem fairly nice and friendly, but <clears throat> seem to have a almost religious devotion to protecting certain plant life, although they had no problem offering other grain type of plant life as like a food offering to the men that were there. Even stranger, and as you read the story, you're kind of like, wait a minute, what, what, what's going on here? They're finding these things. They're on a planet nobody's ever been before. Okay. And yet, they are finding these, uh, let's see if I can find what they call these things. They actually had like a, okay. They're looking at these, um, Machine, some sort of precision instrument that's worth a lot of money. He pointed the raised lettering on it. Model X20 Gamo Products, Warsaw, European Sector. These are some sort of, um, well, some sort of precision device. And they're very expensive. And they just somehow happen to have these things right down to the, the manufacturer's nameplate as if it came from Earth. Why do they have these? And it's like, maybe there's some more on the other planets. Okay, let's take a look at the other planet. They have somewhat different forms of life. So the ones we see in the drawing are on the first planet that we did. The second planet, they're a little more snake-like. But it all amounts to the same thing. There's somewhat different plants and somewhat different animals and very different animals. But the attitude is very much the same. You know, except for this one particular species of flower that is just absolutely violet on both. And it takes a while before these explorers finally kind of start figuring out what happened. What's really going on here? They've been like, they've been used like bees visiting flowers. And they went to one and they picked up its dust. Then they went to the other. And they shed their, shared their dust with these others and picked that up as well. You know? And in exchange, they got these expensive looking instruments. And uh, they feel unusually content with that. And it's only as they're flying away, they decide, let's take a look at these things again. And um, they're just rocks. There was another little <clears throat> weird thing, was that even before they landed, all their controls and so forth were going haywire and statuses and so forth, as far as what's going on with our hyperspace engines, were just going totally haywire. They, oh, we, we need to land. Take a look at this. And then they just didn't. And then when everything just worked, nobody seems to say anything about it until afterwards. Like, no, oh, you just, you didn't even care. He's like, what is going on here? Finally, the one guy figures out, you know, okay, we were pollinating these things. Okay, they got pollinizing, but we need to, but if they can control our minds, they're pretty dangerous plants. They have a rather interesting chain of reasoning that leads to this. And this just kind of goes to show, but, you know, you can't just look at, you know, even facts and just take them and then just say, okay, that's fine, there that is, and it doesn't mean anything to you. You have to think it through. I mean, these same identical flowers have turned up on at least two different planets. 
somebody must have been able, able to fly between the two planets and cross pollinate. What that means is presumably one or the other, or maybe both, of the animal species on these planets probably had once attained space travel. And now suddenly they're living in simple, primitive little mud huts, if even that. And uh, how did they do that? These are plants with some serious mind control powers. So that makes them dangerous. And suddenly they've got to fly back to Earth with all urgency to warn about it, even though this is literally in another galaxy, you know, a globular cluster galaxy. It's not even the Milky Way. And they got to fly back and warn Earth right away. And there's another reason for that. I'll leave that as a, uh, I won't give the spoiler on that. So, it made for a unusual story, actually, but actually interesting. And it's kind of neat to hear the one guy saying, oh, you're out to lunch, you don't know what you're talking about. And you're inclined to believe him until he explains this or that. And kind of like, oh. So, I love it when he can do something like that, where you can really look at something and think you know it. And then somebody else explains the truth, and you go, oh. You know? So, he does that really well. And uh, that's all I have to say for that one. It's a good little story. And uh, future science fiction. Yeah, so he's getting all sorts of different magazines. All right. Thanks for listening.